Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another evening. Another day. I just keep coming, no? Yesterday is gone. Today comes. I bet at the end of today there will be another day. The term for the universe in Buddhism is samsara, sangsara. Sangsara means to wander on. Is there a problem with my sound? All right. To wander on. Chattu nang ariya satcha nang yathabu tang adasana. Through not seeing the Four Noble Truths, Sangsari tang di gamatta nang tasu tasu eva jatisu. Through not seeing these Four Noble Truths, Sangsari tang di gamatta nang. There is this wandering on for a long time, to put it mildly. Diga long, this long wandering. Tasu tasveva jatisu, from birth to birth. Being born, dying here, we're born there. Dying from there, we're born somewhere else. This is the reality that we're faced with. We're unfortunately privileged only to a very short memory. And so we're unable to see truths like the Four Noble Truths. We don't have this science, this knowledge. And so it's not merely by chance that the Buddha's enlightenment came after seeing the rounds of rebirth, or understanding the repetitive and infinite repetition of rebirth. And he saw where our ambitions lead us, where our defilements drag us, where our addictions keep us tied to the wheel of samsara. Like a dog chasing its tail, that's what we are. It's quite depressing, really. <laughs> this, oh, this existence. It's not how we want to look at existence, right? Life is sacred. There is great joy to be had. This is what we want to say, what we want to see. That kind of teaching would go, generally goes over quite a bit better than the depressing teachings of repetition, but but the interesting reality is our our acceptance of suffering, the Four Noble Truths having all to do with suffering and clinging and addiction, our acceptance and our understanding of suffering it's actually the only thing that brings true happiness. 
to thoroughly understanding. You see, because we're we're not actually happy. And we can't actually find happiness. You think that this round of rebirth is is capable of satisfying you that if you get what you want, if you have what you want, if you set up your life in such a way as to provide for all of your desires, you can somehow be satisfied. We're not actually happy. There's this philosophical question about whether it would be better to be a pig satisfied in its in its sty or Socrates, who you know is for philosophers is one of the wisest men in history, meaning to be a wise person but suffer and be made to drink poison now. The interesting thing, of course, about Socrates is that he was at peace when he died, according to the books, anyway. But the real point is that you, wisdom itself, true wisdom, which doesn't just mean knowledge, but it means the, the knowledge of which knowledge, the knowledge to differentiate between knowledges, which is useful, which is useless. True knowledge is the true cause of happiness, that the pig can never be truly happy. You might look at the pig and say, oh, that pig looks happy. And the same goes for humans. You look around you and the human world appears to be full of happiness, right? Everywhere you turn, open up a, a an advertisement full of smiles. Turn on the television, watch a commercial, smiles. Most of our favorite television shows that they used to be anyway, full of smiles. Problems that could be solved and villains that could be vanquished. Heroes that would live happily ever after. This is the story that we tell ourselves. And if it were true, then all would be fine. It would be good for us to be positive about the world. But unfortunately, it's not true. Even those people who will swear up and down that uh, that they're happy would be shocked if they ever tried to practice meditation to realize how truly unhappy they actually are how truly unsatisfied and unable to simply be with their own mind to taste their own mind I mean, meditation really is the true test, right? If you're so happy, let's test. We'll sit here together, quietly, and we'll measure our happiness. We'll measure our minds. We'll put ourselves in the Petri dish, and we'll examine our state of mind. And we'll see that those people who claim to be so happy are full of stress and dissatisfaction and clinging and their happiness is very much dependent on people, places and things, specific people, places and things, concepts, experiences. Without those they can't be pleased, let alone happy. So Buddhism doesn't make Grandois claims about religious truths or anything. It's it's not about proselytizing or, or ranting about the 
evil of defilements and so on. Buddhism doesn't create a whole new religion. That's not really the idea. The Buddha was, he called himself a vibhajavadi. It's someone who just looks at things and tells it like it is. He's able to see through the, or see in, det in detail, just like physical scientists or material scientists are able to split the atom and find subatomic particles and so on. The Buddha was able to do the same with the mind. So the Buddha didn't create something. It's not Buddhism isn't like this. Well, the Buddhism I practice anyway it doesn't have a heaven with a Buddha Buddha God in it, granting all your wishes. And Buddhism is just describing reality and pointing out some aspects of reality that. Are are not terribly obvious or clear to us. It's such a wonderful thing to take someone through a meditation course because you see their eyes opening day by day. You see them swallowing this bitter pill of truth. And they're finally honest with themselves. I mean, isn't that the greatest thing? When you're finally honest with yourself. When you stop fooling yourself, when you stop pretending to be something, when you finally have the opportunity to just you know, to just better yourself, and you see all your ego and all your tricks and all your mental constructs that you've created over your life. And through the practice you free yourself. It's quite simple. So tonight's topic then is samsara. Seeing through the seeing through the delusion of samsara, the 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 narrative that we story that we tell ourselves about how great the world is and how we can find all of uh, find the objects of all of our desires. If only we try harder, if only we cling more, cling tighter to the things we love, s strive after them. Meditation isn't about going somewhere. It's the opposite of this wandering on. It's the opposite of samsara. Stopping, right? You know the story of Angulimala where this man who... If you ever watch the Thai movie, it's a really good rendition. The subtitles are terrible, but... At one point I was trying to redo the subtitles, but never got finished. But... Uh, this in the in the Thai version, which is an adaptation, he he thinks if he kills all these people, he'll become the supreme being, he'll become one with God, kind of thing. He, he hears this voice and thinks that Brahma is telling him to kill all these people, and so he kills them, thinking he's liberating them. And it, it evolves. In the beginning, he's killing evil people, and then in the end, he realizes everyone has evil in them. And he just starts killing everyone <laughs> until finally he meets the Buddha, and the Buddha contrives through magical power to not be caught. And Angulimala chasing after him, running through the forest, yells out, "Stop! Stop!" Yutkan tanok bhut, and the Buddha says. We've already stopped. I've already stopped Angulimala. It's you who should stop. 
meditation is about stopping. When you create karma again and again, hopefully not by killing human beings, but all the karma that we create, this is the wandering on, this is the proliferation, the becoming. Every ambition you embark upon adds to your journey, adds length to your journey, right? lengthens your wandering on, perpetuates the wandering, the cycle. And so we're not doing anything special in meditation, we're just stopping. Yeah, let's stop and at least take stock of where we're headed. Try and learn a little bit about the reasons why we do things, the motivations behind our ambitions and better ourselves and purify our, our intentions and so on, right? Buddhism is an incredibly noble, it's the noble path, the nobility of this, the, the grace and the perfection. This is why people make these statues. How many human beings can say they have statues this grandois made for them? The only other person I can think of, let me see. I mean, uh, Jesus is the other one, right? But even Jesus doesn't have such a... And this is the outspring, the, the outpouring of such faith that people get by hearing and learning and appreciating. Like if you've ever seen in Buddhist societies, when people come to meditation, they're just... Whether they be rich or poor, how it changes their life and how much faith and confidence they get. Even here in the West, you know, how many people come to the meditation and just are, are in awe of the greatness and the purity of this path. So, on that note, I'd like to express my appreciation first and foremost for those meditators who make it all the way here and... and uh, undertake intensive meditation practice. It's you who are truly coming to a stop, making a stand, establishing yourself well in the present moment. Tonight we have another meditator on his way. He called me from the Toronto airport. Coming from America, he's kind of, kind of, uh, well, he's he's been trying to He's never left his country before, and he's rather young, I think, uh, but incredibly intent on getting here, so he's in Canada somewhere on his way. And then to all of you who come out to listen to the Dhamma, listening to the Dhamma is something unique, uniquely special in the world this opportunity to learn not just another philosophy or another one more way of understanding the world but to learn the the way to understand the world the way to see through our delusions and to free ourselves from all suffering So, much appreciation to you all. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for coming up. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And the bell rings. That means we've got a visitor. Each one of you guys let him in and I'll take over. Perfect timing. <laughs> this is probably the young guy. It's okay. Let them in. You can. You guys can go ahead. Hi. Go. You can. Ali, you can go ahead. You don't have to. Yeah. He made it. <laughs> He's here. Jawan. 
How do you spell? How do you pronounce your name? Uh, Javen. Javen. Sorry. Come on in. Have a seat for a second. I'm just answering questions and. Welcome. Glad you made it. <laughs> Any questions? If there's no questions, I'm going to introduce our new meditator to the center. Didn't Anguli Mala kill because he wanted to offer a garland of fingers to his teacher? No, no, that's not it. No, the original text is, I think with the commentaries, is that uh, his teacher, his, he was his favorite, he was the teacher's pet. And so the other students were jealous and they contrived to turn the teacher against Anguli Mala. And so they... Uh, convinced the teacher that Angulimala was having an affair with the teacher's wife. Now, this is how the Thai version sticks to this more or less. Um, and he gets caught in a sort of a comprom. It's a little bit more complicated. It's actually, you know, it's 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 really well done the Thai version, except for all the killing. It's just full of full of. Most of the movie is just about blood and gore, but the actual story behind it is really really well done. Um, but sticking to the original story, so they convince this guy, and, and so the teacher does, gets convinced and wants to, as a result, destroy Angulimala. So he says to Angulimala that in order to graduate, he has to, something like in order to graduate, he has to bring him a thousand, or he has to kill a thousand people. And so what Angulimala, the, the finger thing, is just in order to count them. Because he, how's he going to count a hundred? Well, he cuts the thumb maybe off of each uh, off one hand of, of each person he kills and he makes a necklace so he can count that's how he can count to a thousand so he becomes known as Angulimala now the actual texts are quite sparse they don't have a lot of uh, they don't have any of this commentary it's just there's a story of a, a, a bandit called Angulimala who cuts people's fingers off but uh Commentaries have all sorts of stories about him And then there's a sutta Giving a story after When Angulimala is already a monk it's the, I guess that's the Angulimala sutta, right? No, it's, yeah So uh, you know, the, the garland of fingers wasn't the gift to his teacher It's just a count No, the whole killing people because he wanted to send them to heaven, that was the Thai version. Really well done. It's really, I mean, it's not canonical, but uh, it's a really good story. I don't know if you've ever seen the short video I did with clips of it. Uh, really, there's a really good section that I put together and put on YouTube a long time ago. Um, take a look at it. You get a sort of a taste of what the movie's like. There was a lot of controversy surrounding the film because it wasn't um, it wasn't quite canonical, and there was a bit of a romance between Angulimala and the wife. She ends up following him into the jungle, and they, or, or yeah, they escape together. Uh, but they never. It's, it's very careful not to actually have them be in a romantic relationship, and he eventually becomes a monk, of course. Okay, I'll let you all watch that video and I'm going to sneak out the back door and go, go in, uh, meet my new meditator. So have a good night everyone.